Okay, Unit 2, Plant Structure and Physiology, Lesson 2, Plant Physiology. Plant physiology uh, is a study of all of the processes that go on inside of a plant to keep it alive. Vascular plants, and most plants are vascular plants, have what's called a vascular system that moves water, nutrients, and raw materials to the sites of photosynthesis and sugars and proteins that are manufactured there down to the rest of the plant. This vascular system has an analog in humans. We have a blood system and a lymph system that moves materials around our body to places where it's needed. Plants do that through their vascular system. They take in air through the leaves and remove the component that they need for photosynthesis, which is carbon dioxide. They use the carbon dioxide in photosynthesis and they expel the waste gas that they don't need, which is oxygen. We're kind of lucky for us that that's the waste gas that plants produce. They're able to accomplish all of this without a heart or lungs. Let's look at the vascular system of plants. The vascular system of a plant moves material through two separate types of tubes called the xylem and the phloem. The xylem carries raw materials like water, nutrients, minerals, things like that, up from the roots of the plant to the shoots and the leaves, where it can be used by the plant in photosynthesis. The phloem then carries the food that's manufactured by photosynthesis back down through the plant to places where it's needed or to where it's going to be stored. Phloem consists of living tissues which carry sugars and proteins away from the site of photosynthesis into areas where they're needed or going to be stored like tubers and roots. The phloem exists in leaves, in stems, and in roots. Keep in mind, phloem is living tissue. Xylem carries the water and raw materials up from the roots to the sites of photosynthesis, which in most plants is usually the leaves. Some plants can photosynthesize in stems and shoots as well. Now, unlike phloem, which is always living tissue, xylem can consist of both living and dead cells. Wood in trees or woody plants like shrubs and some woody vines consists largely of dead xylem cells, while living xylem cells may exist in the leaves and non-woody parts of woody plants. So some plants have entire sections of their xylem made from dead xylem cells and living cells in only areas of the plant. Now we'll look at the structure of leaves. Leaves in a plant are quite complicated structures. Their main job is carrying out photosynthesis, so to create food and energy for the plant. In a cross section, starting from the top of a leaf, they consist of cuticle, upper epidermis, palisade mesophyll, spongy mesophyll, and lower epidermis. We'll look at a diagram in a moment. The cuticle is a waxy layer over the surface of the leaf that helps protect the leaf from drying out and somewhat from mechanical damage like insects or animals chewing on it or leaves banging together in a windstorm. The upper epidermis or outer skin layer of the leaf exists just below the cuticle. It is the upper skin for a leaf. The palisade mesophyll consists of structures, cells, oriented vertically, up and down in cross-section, and contain most of the chloroplasts where photosynthesis takes place. The spongy mesophyll is below that and is sort of a jumble of cells without particular orientation. And it's above 
the lower epidermis. This is a place where sap will pass through, where materials will pass through, where certain materials are stored. <coughs> and it helps give the plant leaf some structure. The lower epidermis is the bottom skin on a leaf. This is the part of the leaf that has the openings that let them let the leaves take in air, carbon dioxide, and expel oxygen. The plant will also lose some water vapor, some water as water vapor through the stomata. The plants have the ability to open and close stomata. We'll take a look at that in a moment. The stomata are critical in a plant because they're where the plant exchanges the gases. They can take in carbon dioxide, get rid of the oxygen. They're where the plants can lose water vapor through transpiration. It's uh, sort of an evaporative process. The difference in water vapor pressure as water is lost through the stomates is one way that plants can draw water from the roots up to great heights without a pump like a heart that people have. So as plants will lose water through the stomates, the water pressure, water vapor pressure in the leaves becomes lower. The water vapor pressure down in the roots is much higher because they're nearly saturated and that forces that water up through the plant through the xylem where it can be used. Guard cells border the stomata on either side. This is a pair of cells which can expand and, contra and contract, causing the stomata to close or open. When they're expanded, it forces the stomata shut. When they contract, it pulls the stomata open. It's a way that plants can control the transpiration and water loss uh, and is uh, critical, particularly for plants in arid environments. Okay, here we have a diagram of a leaf. As we can see, on the top, we have the cuticle. Now the cuticle is a waxy layer, not living tissue, it's secreted by the upper epidermis and by the lower epidermis. It exists actually on both sides. Next we have the upper epidermis consists of cells oriented more or less horizontally, connected end to end, and is sort of the protective outer layer beneath the cuticle. Below that, we have the palisades mesophyll, which are these vertically oriented cells that contain most of the chloroplasts and where most of the photosynthesis in a cell takes place. Below that, we have this area called the spongy mesophyll. And you can see this is liquid filled. It's where carbon dioxide and oxygen exchange happens. That's followed by, on this level, the lower epidermis. Again, cells similar to the upper epidermis oriented across the cell. Now, not all of the lower epidermal cells are connected as they are on the top. You'll see here there's an opening between two of those cells, and that's a stomate. The cells located on either side, here and here, are the guard cells. When these cells are contracted as they are now, they pull away from the stomate and open it up. The cells can absorb water from the spongy mesophyll or even from adjacent cells and expand the other way causing the stomates to close and it's that way that plants regulate their use of air and control their loss of water.
Over here, we see this little bundle of materials. Okay, together, that's called a, fa a vascular bundle. And it consists of the two things that we talked about before, the xylem, which moves material up through the plant, and phloem, which, can t uh, which carries finished materials back down to the plant to places where they're needed. Photosynthesis. This is a key process for plants. It's like kind of their whole trick. Plants have the ability to take in carbon dioxide from the air around them. They then split the oxygen molecules from the carbon atom and combine the carbon with hydrogen and some raw materials that come from the soil and they manufacture sugar. And sugar is what a plant uses as food. The mitochondria, as we saw, take that sugar and break it down and that releases the actual energy that the plant cell needs to live. This whole process of bringing in carbon dioxide, splitting it apart, splitting water apart, recombining all of these things into sugar is called photosynthesis. And remember, only plants, algae, and cyanobacteria have the ability to do photosynthesis. The net result of all this is sugar for the plant, which is a convenient energy storage form. And then the waste product of the plant, something that we call oxygen. So again, handy thing for us that the plants give off oxygen. Now we'll talk about the entire life cycle of a plant. And they go through a life cycle like all other living things. They're born, essentially, they grow, and eventually they die. This section discusses that basic process. So there can be some differences, especially on the born end of things, as some plants reproduce vegetatively rather than always through seed. But essentially, we'll discuss the whole life cycle. So plants can reproduce, and most of them reproduce either sexually or asexually. Most plants have the ability to do both. Asexual reproduction, or reproduction without sexual cells involved, is called vegetative reproduction. So when you have an African violet and you cut a leaf off and you stick it down in some sand or some uh, perlite or something like that with moisture and it develops into a new plant that's vegetative reproduction. So it occurs when a new plant forms from the parent plant directly without having grown from a seed. So as I mentioned, when you cut a piece of plant and you root it, that's a form of asexual reproduction. It's also something called cloning because the definition of a clone is a new organism that has the exact same DNA as its parent, singular parent. So taking a cutting from a plant is making a clone of that plant. Therefore, the new plant will have exactly the same properties as uh, the original parent plant. Sexual reproduction is much more complicated. Um, but it's also uh, incredibly important for plants because it's a process in which the gene pool of plants can get sort of mixed up and uh, give them a wider variety of genes than they might have. You can imagine if you're cloning plants, you're just taking cuttings. Every single one of those resulting plants has exactly the same DNA as the plant that you took it from. If a plant disease comes along, that happens to affect that clone of the plant uh, very strongly, 
it's likely that all of those clones will die. If you have a population of plants in which many of them have been reproduced sexually, the genes will be slightly different from each other, and it's likely that a substantial portion of the population will survive a, uh, a devastating disease or something like that. Um, so sexual reproduction is very important for plants. Plants have a couple of different ways of going about it, but in essence, it, it kind of boils down to they produce gametes, um, which are the sperm and the eggs. Um, exactly how and where those gametes are produced depends on whether a plant is a flowering plant, which is an angiosperm, and most plants are flowering plants, or a non-flowering plant, which is a gymnosperm. Most plants that we think of as evergreens, pine trees, spruce trees, things like that, are gymnosperms. They don't have true flowers. Um, for the purposes of this section, we're going to look at angiosperm reproduction or flowering plant reproduction. Angiosperms reproduce sexually using special reproductive structures called flowers. The flowers may contain either male parts, or they may contain female parts, or they may contain both. In species that have separate male and female flowers, an individual plant might have only male flowers, it might have only female flowers, or it might have both. But each individual flower will be separate, will be a male or a female. Though some flowers have both male and female parts, and such flowers are called perfect. Some flowers are only male. Those are called andricious flowers. And some flowers are only female, and they're gynecious flowers. This diagram of flower structure shows a perfect flower. The female parts of the flower uh, are contained in the central structure. The stigma, which is this tip of the female structure. The style, which is the supporting area of the female structure. Below that, below the style, is the ovary. The male parts are up here. This tip is called an anther. It's where the pollen cells are produced. The anther is supported by this part called the filament. Over to the right here, we have a uh, sort of a more close-up diagram of a plant ovary, inside of which are ovules, these little ovular things. Each ovule contains an egg, and what happens in pollination is that the pollen from an anther is deposited on the stigma of a flower. The pollen grain then opens and releases sperm cells which travel down through the style make their way to the ovary and fertilize the eggs contained in the ovules. So the basic process is the flower develops the pollen, the pollen contains the male gametes or sperm. The pollen is then deposited either by wind or water or animals like insects on the female structure of a flower called a pistil. The sperm are released from the pollen grain and travel through the pistil, the stigma, the style, down to the ovaries, and then eventually reach the eggs in the ovules and fertilize them. When the sperm reaches the egg, just like in animals, fertilization occurs. The fertilized egg then develops into an embryo, which is essentially a miniature plant. It may not look exactly like the adult plant is going to look, but it has a lot of the structure of an adult plant. They often will have um, identifiable structures that will develop to leaves 
Um, one end will develop into roots, and so you essentially have a miniature plant. Around that miniature plant, a structure develops called the seed coat, which will protect the embryo when it's separated from the ovary. And inside that seed coat, the uh, plant develops food that will nourish that embryo. So imagine a seed being planted, and then it starts to grow. It sends down a root. It sends up a shoot. But while it's doing that, it, it's not yet able to photosynthesize. It has no leaves, so it can't manufacture food. It uses this food stored in the seed to grow during that period of time. And then when it opens up its first leaves and begins to photosynthesize, it's kind of on its own. The rest of the ovary that contains all of these ovules develops into a fruit. So a plant fruit is a ripened ovary. So an apple, an orange, a watermelon, whatever. All of those things, including beans and tomatoes and cucumbers, botanically are all fruits because they are ripened ovaries. Uh, Food-wise, we might not consider tomatoes and cucumbers fruits, but uh, botanically they are. The seeds exist inside the fruit, and there might be many seeds, like in an apple or an orange, or there might be just a single seed, as you would find in a peach or a coconut. Plants over the years have designed their fruits so that seeds can be dispersed. One way they do this is by making them attractive to animals. The animals then eat the fruit and consequently the seeds, and the animals move away and get rid of the <laughs> products there and plant the seeds. Another way they do it is to make them easily moved by wind, as dandelion fluff, for instance, or maple tree helicopters. Um, another potential method of dispersion is making them be able to withstand immersion in water for long periods of time. This often happens to coconuts. They fall off a tree, maybe washed out into the sea, and carried for hundreds or thousands of miles to a different place where they encounter land and then begin to grow. Um, some plants have somewhat more violent um, methods of seed dispersal, like touch-me-nots, um, where the entire ovary develops into a mechanism that's under tension. And once the uh, tension reaches a certain point, whenever the plant gets touched, that tension is released and the seeds are physically thrown, sometimes several feet through the air to another place for seed dispersal. Once the seeds are free, they need to germinate. They need to lodge in a suitable place that has sufficient water, that has the right balance of sunlight. Some seeds will only germinate if they can see light. Other seeds will only germinate if they're dark. But in any case, germination always starts with the seed imbibing water. The seed coats of some plants are really tough and don't let water in. So those plants need some process uh, to wear down the seed coat, maybe passing through the digestive tract of an animal, maybe being uh, rubbed up against uh, grains of sand or something like that, to cut the seed coat a little bit so that the water can get in. The embryo inside, once the imbibation of water has happened, sends out a shoot which will develop into the stem and will contain leaves and a root. And it does this, as I mentioned before, by using the food that was stored in the seed. The endosperm that's in the seed provides the food for the embryo to do this until it produces leaves or structures that are able to photosynthesize. And if conditions are right, it will produce those photosynthetic structures before they've used up all of the food store contained in the seed, and then you have a living plant on its own. This photograph shows a basic uh, seed structure. This happens to be a uh, ginkgo seed. 
On the outer edge here, you can see a bit of the seed coat, this hard covering that protects the seed. Inside of that is this area that contains food for the plant. And this little guy here is the embryo that will develop into the new ginkgo tree if it's successful in germination and uh, finds the conditions to its liking. Once these plants have germinated, the seeds have germinated, how long does a plant life cycle last? Well, it depends on the type of plant. An annual will grow from a seed to a mature plant, produce a flower, reproduce and create new seeds on the new plant all within one year. Perennials will grow year after year and may flower many times. Uh, most of our woody plants, trees and shrubs are perennials. Other plants like daylilies and hostas are perennials. Some plants are biennials and with biennials they usually spend their first year developing leaves and flowers and a good root system. The leaves of a biennial typically form a flat rosette on the ground during their first year. The second year, they flower, produce seeds, and die. So the time it takes to complete development totally depends on the type of plant. We mentioned that the uh, pollen grains get from one flower to another flower, or from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower, um, carried by wind, water, or animals, like insects. And plants, many of them have evolved close relationships to certain animals and insects and can only be pollinated by those animals or insects. Uh, take the plant away from the area in which that animal or insect lives and the plant will not be able to reproduce in those areas. Other plants are sort of generalists, and they're not as picky about the, uh, the pollinators that they have, and they'll accept a lot of different things. For instance, apple trees could be pollinated by honeybees or bumblebees or certain types of flies or wasps or almost any type of insect. Other plants depend on wind or rain for pollination. For instance, corn plants don't attract pollinators at all. And they produce the male flowers separate from female flowers. And the male flowers are produced at the very top of the plant. The pollen is released and is blown by wind. And as it blows across the cornfield and descends, um, it lands on the female parts of other corn plants. Uh, some plants uh, have the, a similar process but depend upon rain. That finishes. Uh, this section on plant physiology.